let's go ahead and look into 1 Corinthians. If you haven't turned there already, chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians. Uh, what Paul is going to talk about today is really kind of a theme that's going to run through the rest of the, the book and really has been running through the book. Uh, you know, just this idea of building this church up. This church is a very weak, carnal church, and Paul is, is correcting them on their uh, errors uh, he's correcting them about the way they're going about doing things, about their carnality. A great many things he's already corrected. He's answering questions that they have. And so he's trying to build them up in their faith. And uh, one of the things he's going to talk about today, he's going to talk about idolatry, of course, is something that uh, was running rampant at that time in, in that place, uh, certainly. And, uh, and so he's going to deal with that, but he's going to deal with it with the idea of love being involved. And so I've entitled the message, Build with Love, because he will continually say on through the rest of the book, really, you know, if, if you have knowledge of something, that's a good thing. But if you don't have love and if you don't bring across uh, a love as you're communicating the truth, then you really are missing the mark greatly. And so we're going to look at the whole chapter today, and you might kind of think I'm trying to speed up, you know, like the horse on the way back to the barn, you know. Oh, I'm almost done. Almost done with the book. i got to speed up and get back there. But it's not the case, you know. It's just a complete thought that Paul is giving us here. And so I, I couldn't see a way to break it up. And so if you look at uh, chapter 8 with me, in verse 1 there it says, Now concerning things offered to idols... We know that we have, uh, that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on the earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some with consciousness of the idol until now, eat it as the thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food does not condemn us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, Will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble." Heavenly Father, we thank you for these things, Lord. We thank you for your word, your truth, Lord. And we ask that today, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, as we uh, deal with each other, as we deal with folks outside of the church here, Lord, that we would communicate your truth, but communicate it in a loving way. We ask, Lord, that, uh, that you would do this with, on our behalf here today, Lord, because we know that in our natural state, we have no ability to, uh, to love in that way. And we need your help. Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to bring forth that good fruit within our lives so that we may love the brothers and sisters around us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, build with love is the idea here. The idea of just building upon the foundation, building upon those weak foundations with love, building with uh, the love that God is is bringing to us. I uh, found this... uh, uh, ah, the key here is that I am not only practi- that I am only practicing idolatry. It is not like I'm really idolatrating. Uh, the idea, you know, uh, maybe you've had this kind of situation where you've come across one of your Christian brothers or sisters, and they're doing something that you know they shouldn't be doing, or they know they shouldn't be doing, and you catch them red-handed in it. And there's a tendency to really point the finger and to really get after them about that. And certainly when there's an outright sin, we need to be correcting them. But we also need to be doing it with a sense of love. We need to be doing it with a a sense of gentleness 
and, uh, and, and just really communicating God's love through that. And so, of course, idolatry was a huge, huge issue to these first century Christians. Many of them came out of the Jewish faith. And as a result of that, they, uh, they knew firsthand that the Jewish nation had been destroyed, utterly and totally destroyed as a result of their idolatry. And so they learned a very, very painful lesson as a, as a people, as a heritage of people. They learned that uh, idolatry will destroy them. And so, of course, when they uh, became believers in Jesus Christ and, and possibly were around Greek believers who had come in from the pagan world and were still involved in that idolatry or, or still, you know, just had those kind of remnants hanging on, uh, you know, it was a very sensitive issue. And again, these are questions that Paul is answering. They have asked these questions to Paul. Hey, Paul, what about some of these Christians that are still eating meat that's offered to idols? And, you know, we know that's wrong. And, you know, what's up with that? What should we do about those Christians that are still involved in that stuff? And, uh, and so Paul communicates it back to them in a way. Yes, you need to say something about it. You need to do something about it. But make sure you do it in love. And we've dealt with this subject before, haven't we? If you've been here for a while, as we went through the book of Romans, Paul talked about this to the Romans as well because they were also living in that carnal society, worshiping idols and all those sorts of things. And so Paul dealt with it in Romans 14, 19. He said, Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, But it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. And so this idea of Christian liberty, yes, we may have a Christian liberty. We may have a a sense that, you know, God, this isn't a problem for me. This isn't a sin issue for me. Uh, I don't feel a conviction from the Holy Spirit about this, and it's something I feel like I can do. Uh, and, And of course, you know, in the society we live in today, we're not dealing with going down to a temple somewhere and and eating food that's been offered to idols. But we can apply it in so many other areas of our own life. You know, uh, I have the liberty to possibly go to movies and you don't. I have the liberty to watch this television show and maybe you don't. I have the liberty. I feel like God has given me that liberty to do something. But if it's going to make my brother stumble, if it's going to make my sister uh, be grieved in their conscience, in their mind, their perception is that that brother is in sin when he does that. I I need to be uh, concerned about that. I need to watch out for my brothers and sisters and not do something that intentionally makes them stumble in their faith or stumble in their belief system. And so it's very important. We don't want to be condemning ourselves in what we approve is, is the idea there. Uh, we do condemn ourselves. It might be something that I approve of. I feel it's not a sin. But when I make my brother stumble or make my sister stumble as a result of what I'm doing, I'm now con- bringing condemnation on myself. I'm now sinning not only... Uh, against them, I'm sinning against Christ because He died for them and He loves them. And, and so I'm really uh, sinning against the Lord Himself. Someone once said that truth without love is brutality. And I think that's very, very true. I don't know who, who quoted this, but they hit it right on the head. Truth without love is brutality. We must bring truth with love. But love without truth is hypocrisy. And so we need to have both is what Paul is ultimately getting at here. Uh, if we don't have you know, truth in, in the love that we're bringing across, it, there's, it, it's meaningless. We're just uh, you know, a clanging symbol, as Paul would say later on. And, and so again, as we go through the rest of the book of, of Corinthians, Paul will talk about this a lot. You know, yes, do it in love, though. You've got the knowledge, but do it in love. And so uh, a very simple outline here today as we go back over it and look at it in in a little more detail. Knowledge puffs up is what Paul is saying. But the other end of that, what is it? Love edifies, right? Love edifies. Love builds up. You have a puffiness with the arrogance of of just knowledge. Uh, You know, it's kind of like an expansion, but it's not. It's like steroids, you know. It's not real muscle that was built with with hard work and working out. 
it's kind of inflated and it has a tendency to be weak and, and tear is easy and causes damage to the muscle. It can get deflated very quickly and uh, cause a lot of problems. But love is something that builds with stability. Love is something that really builds and, and it's a lasting uh, growth that happens there. And so again, as we uh, go back and look at the things here concerning idols, this is the second thing that Paul is going to deal with. Last week, uh, you know, we looked at some other things he was dealing with, uh, whether young uh, kids should get married, and, and we dealt with marriage for quite a while there, about a month we dealt with marriage. So now he moves on to that next topic uh, concerning idols, concerning things offered to idols, food that was offered to idols. Within the religious system there, they had temples all over the place and, and people would bring food to offer to those false gods, those idols. And of course, the false gods don't consume them. And so here's all this meat lying around after that worshiper leaves. And so the priests would take that food and they would eat some of it for themselves. That would be their payment for being a priest. And then the rest of it, uh, they would sell or they would uh, serve it there in the temple. Uh, We kind of get the idea a little bit later that uh, there might even have been some people eating the food there in the temple. As he says there, you know, because uh, somebody might see you going into that temple and eating, and it's going to make them stumble. But it was just this idea that the food was then sold to a market, and it was cheap. And so the idea there, it's cheap food. Cheap meat from the temple. And, and I think, you know, that's an interesting way of looking at it. You know, as, as we say, well, I've got the liberty to do this. I've got the liberty to have some beer in my refrigerator and drink beer. And, I, and people just need to deal with that, you know. Fine, that's good. That's liberty. That's good. That's all right. But keep it to yourself because you never know who you might stumble. And, uh, you know, I think I told the story last time when we were going through uh, Romans that uh, very early on we had a party for New Year's Eve and we decided, well, you know, let's just have a bottle of champagne. And and so we invited a bunch of our Christian friends from the church over and a young couple came and it turns out one of them was an alcoholic and it really, really stumbled her because she was emboldened then to think that it's okay for Christians to drink every once in a while. That's great. And so she drank with us and it really caused a problem. We stumbled them. For my little cheap thrill, my little cheap high, or my little cheap uh, enjoyment, or something, my little thing that I really like to do, something from my past that I haven't given up yet, that I feel I've got the liberty to still do this. The Lord hasn't convicted me about this one yet, and I'm holding on to it for dear life. This is my thing. I can listen to this music. I can do this. You know, they're really just kind of cheap thrills, and and they really don't make a, a, a hill of difference in the light of eternity. But we want to hold on to them. And so for the cheap meat that I can get in the temple, rather than going to the regular markets and buying meat at a a regular price that everybody else is paying for it, I'll make my brother stumble. It's okay. It's cheap meat. That's my justification. And, of course, we can justify the things that we like to do uh, in the same way today. And so we need to be very careful about those things. He says there, and I want to uh, read this from the Amplified because it really gives some great clarification to it. It says, all of us possess knowledge concerning these matters. All of us as Christians, you know, we have a knowledge of, you know, we're not worshiping false idols. We're not going down to that temple to do these things. We have that knowledge. Yet, mere knowledge causes people to be puffed up, to bear themselves loftily and proud. But love Affection and goodwill and benevolence edifies and builds up and encourages one to grow to his full stature. If anyone imagines that he has come to know and understand much of divine things without love, he does not yet perceive and recognize and understand as strongly and clearly, nor as, nor has he become as intimately acquainted with, this is a mouthful, with anything as he ought or as is necessary. You don't really know as much as you think you know is basically what is being said there. If you think you know everything about spiritual matters and yet it's only knowledge and you're not communicating it in love, you don't know anything. You don't know anything. And then in verse 3, he kind of goes on there to say, you know, if you really, really know the Lord in this way, 
having this knowledge mixed with the love that comes through it, you know, you're, you're really uh, in touch with what's going on here. In verse 3 he says, But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. If anybody loves God in this way, not just knowing him, knowing about him, knowing about his doctrine, knowing about these things, but actually really having that true relationship with him, a true loving relationship that is coming through as I now am able to love others. That person really knows God and is known by God is kind of what Paul is getting at there. And so that's a very important aspect. Knowledge just puffs you up. It makes you arrogant. It makes you proudful, prideful. And, and it's really just a, a, a Phariseeism. That's what the Pharisees were all about, right? Right? They knew a lot. They knew the Bible backwards, frontwards, upside down, diagonally. I mean, they studied it. They, they wrote about it. They comment, commented on it by writing other huge books that were three times as big as the law uh, that kind of described what the law was really saying and those kind of things. They knew it. They knew the information, but it was a knowledge when somebody came into the temple with a withered hand and, and Jesus was going to uh, heal that hand. Oh, you can't do that on the Sabbath day. Come on now. And that's what Jesus was constantly needling at them. What if I, what if I healed this guy on the Sabbath? That would really blow your knowledge, wouldn't it? And he did it. Boom. Heals somebody on the Sabbath. And they get all angry. Ugh. And Jesus said, it's because of that hardness of your heart. That's what's going on there. It's a hardness that's making me do this. And there's no love there. Well, as we continue on, a little bit later again, Paul talks about this idea. In dealing with spiritual, spiritual gifts, you know, uh, this church, not only were they involved in divisive behavior and carnality and all kinds of sexual immorality, uh, idolatry, all this stuff, they also were a very charismatic church. Boy, we got all the gifts at work going here. They were ultra charismatic in their, in their worship of the Lord. And it was out of order, completely out of order. And so Paul is correcting him in that way as well and, and giving them a firm foundation when it comes to dealing with spiritual gifts. And again, he comes back to this idea of love being the key. He says there, and, and we won't go in depth on it because we're going to cover it later, but he says in chapter 13, verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. Listen to what Paul is saying there. I am nothing. If I don't have love, I'm nothing. I'm nothing at all. All that knowledge, all those gifts, all that stuff on the outside, just like the Pharisees, it's nothing. It's nothing. Well, in verse 4 there, it says, Therefore concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. There's only one God. Those idols that are made out of metal and brick and stone and and, and wood, are, they're nothing. I love this story, and I, I know I shared this uh, illustration with you guys once before, but it was a while ago, and hopefully you've forgotten about it. But uh, this Japanese warlord, he commissions this massive statue of Buddha to be built in a shrine, a massive shrine that goes over it in Kyoto. And uh, it took a long, long time. It took 50,000 men five years to build this, the statue itself of Buddha and the shrine that went over the top of it to keep it out of the rain and everything. Massive thing. As soon as he finished it, as soon as he finished it, the earthquake of 1596 brought the roof of the shrine crashing down and wrecked the statue. 
And this warlord got so mad that he fired an arrow at the statue of Buddha. And he screamed out, I put you here at a great expense, he shouted. And you can't even look after your own temple. <laughs> it's the epitome of idolatry. It's worthless. It's nothing. There's no God behind this thing. It's just a hunk of metal. It can't defend itself, and it certainly can't defend you. It's nothing. Idolatry is nothing. And, and Paul says, look, we all know that as, as, as grounded Christians. It's, it's uh, you know, no debate. There is one God. There isn't, there isn't a bunch of gods out there. There's only one God. Augustine said, idolatry is worshiping something that ought to be used and using something that ought to be worshipped. And so there's a breakdown in knowledge. There's a breakdown in knowledge. The things that we uh, worship often, you know, our cars and our, uh, our little toys and the little idols that we have today. The things that just need to be used. Uh, they have a utilitarian purpose, but we often dedicate so much time and energy and emotional attachment and, uh, and those kind of things to them that we're actually, in a sense, worshiping them. Because we spend far more time with those things than we do with the Lord that we should be worshiping. Far more time dealing with those issues in life that we really love and care about than we do the Lord Jesus Christ that we should be caring more for. He's the one that we should be worshiping. Well, it's neat that he says, you know, we do have knowledge of this, this one thing. We know for sure this one thing and that there is one God. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth and there is no other God out there. Not even one. He's the only one true God. And so you have to ask that question then. Isn't that why there's only one true way to get to that one true God? Does it make sense if there's one God that created everything and he desires to be worshipped in a, a particular way uh, and he makes the rules? Doesn't it make sense that there's only one way to find your way to him? It, it makes sense, doesn't it? It's a logical conclusion. It's very illogical to say, oh, well, there are many roads to God. You know, as long as you're sincere about it, it doesn't matter what you believe. As long as you're really sincere about that belief and as long as you're heartfelt about it, uh, you'll make it to God. Even though what you believe is completely wrong about him and not even completely wrong, blasphemous against him and, and just really uh, hateful against him. There's one true God. There's only one way to get to him. Isaiah 44, 6 says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. I'm the only one, he's saying there. My Redeemer, Jesus, said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. Nobody gets to the Father except they come through me. There's only one way because there's only one God. There's only one way because there's only one truth. There's only one way because there's one God who designed it to be that way. And so it might appear to some that, you know, that, that's not a, uh, something I can deal with or I don't want to, you know, just be so narrow or whatever you want to say about that. But it only makes sense, it, it, sense that if there's one God, there's only one way. Well, I wanted to uh, turn back to uh, 1 Kings for just a minute here. That's all the way back in the Old Testament. But I know you can handle that because you guys are all Bible scholars. And I'm sure you can find it. Turning back over to 1 Kings, we have a very famous story, uh, a, a very funny story really, about this idea of idolatry. Elijah called for a showdown, essentially. Uh, he was just sick and tired of all of the people of Israel worshiping the idols, the idols of Baal. And there were hundreds of priests and, and worshipers in the nation that were going after those false gods rather than following the Lord and really going in opposition to 
what the Lord had for them. And so Elijah says, hey, you get all your priests up here on the hill and we're going to have a showdown. We'll find out whose God is real and whose God is false. And there in verse 24, he said, then you can call the name on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first for you are many and call on the name of your God and but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon saying, O oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped out about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves as was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. When midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, uh, of the Lord that was broken down. Now what he did next, I'm not going to read through the whole thing, it's a little lengthy, but he, he, he said, Okay, now you, you take lots of water, you take four pots of water, and you pour it all over that altar, just drench it. What he wanted to show was that the real God will consume this, this food here that's on the altar. They had brought their bull and they prepared it and they put it all on there and they're waiting for their God to consume it with fire. But nothing happens. And so Elijah says, all right, now you take four pots of water and you pour it all over the place. Do it again. Okay, do it again. Okay, do it again. And so water's everywhere. It's drenched. The wood is drenched. The food is drenched. The whole altar is drenched with water. And then... After all that, in verse 36, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, no kidding. And they said, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And and basically just saying, Yahweh, He is God. Or Jehovah, He is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon Kishon, and executed them. And so there you see, who is God? The real real God has power. The real God has abilities. The real God can hear our voice. The real God can do things in our lives. Make himself known to us. And he does. He does. The real God can create the universe. The real God has the power to do that. And so worship Him. Don't worship false idols. Don't worship dumb pieces of stone and and marble and, and metal that can't do anything for you. Worship the real, one and true and living God that is invisible. Don't make anything fashioned after Him and worship that thing. That's what He told them in the Ten Commandments, essentially. And so turning back over to your passage in in 1 Corinthians, it's interesting here in this passage and in really all through the Bible, the weaker vessel is never commanded or never required to come up to a higher level for the sake of that stronger vessel. And so it is within the church as well. The weaker among us, the, the younger believers the ones that are still stumbling with these things, the ones that were stumbling with watching older, mature Christians eating that meat. Hey, this is just meat. There's nothing special about this meat. 
the idols don't exist. And so the meat that's offered to them is not cursed or anything else. And hey, it's cheap meat. I'm just going to eat it. But that weaker vessel is never called to change for the behalf, on the behalf of the stronger vessel. We as the stronger are called upon to not make that person stumble. We are called upon in love to make it right and to, to not uh, hurt that person, not break them down, but to build them up, to encourage them, not to make them stumble in their faith. And so love edifies is the idea. Love builds up. I guess I better get back over to my passage here. However, we know these things, Paul's saying, but however, not everybody has that knowledge. Not everybody has come to that place of maturity. Not everybody has come to that place of understanding these things and you will hurt them. You will maybe even cause them to stumble back into their sin, back into their pagan ways. If you, with your liberty, uh, choose to exercise it in front of them. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some with consciousness of the idol until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. They have a weak conscience. They're not built up in their faith yet. They're not rooted and grounded in the word yet. You think about all of the knowledge that our Heavenly Father has. And how He treats us with such love and care and grace and mercy. Long-suffering. He's patient with us. Because we don't have the knowledge. You think about the contrast between the knowledge that he has and the knowledge of the strongest, most knowledgeable Christian living today. And it doesn't even compare, does it? I mean, we have all of the knowledge that God's word gives us. And that, the Bible says, gives us enough knowledge to make it through this life. We have everything that we need here in his word and his spirit's dwelling within us. And he's given us insights and and wisdom and discernment. But still, we're, we're looking through that glass darkly, it says. Can't quite see it very clearly. We don't see it very clearly. We don't have all the knowledge. And yet our Father is patient with us. He's loving. He's forgiving. He's faithful. He doesn't give up on us. He doesn't rub it in our face. He doesn't say, buck up, just change. Come on, get better. He's very patient and loving and kind with us. And so as a result, you and I need to have that same approach because what we're trying to be molded into the image of Jesus Christ, right? We are trying to model the, what, what he modeled for us. A self-sacrificing kind of, of, of a walk before other people. And so there are limits to our Christian liberty, aren't there? Yes, we have liberty, but there are limits that need to be there for the sake of others, for our own sake. And so I want to talk about a couple of those. And he says there in verse 8, Food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But But beware... Lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weaker brother perish for whom Christ died? Well, the answer, of course, is absolutely not. Your Christian liberty doesn't give you the, the ability to go and, and hurt the conscience of, of another believer. Not at all. And so we need to have a sense of understanding the limits of our Christian liberty. That's true. As you mature in the Lord, you, you come to uh, places where you realize, boy, all that, all that legalistic stuff that I was doing when I was a young Christian was man-made silliness. But if I don't maintain that in front of this person, I know they'll be stumbled by it. And, you know, all the different religious traditions that we come from, you know, Southern Baptist or, uh, you know, charismatic or, you know, wherever you're coming from, there are things that you believe that this is absolute doctrine and 
man, you've got to do this. And, and if you don't, you're in sin. But when it really comes down to it, when you mature in the Lord, you start realizing this doesn't mean anything. This doesn't commend me to God. This doesn't make me any more spiritual than I was if I didn't do this. And it's the same idea here. And so, but we really need to be careful with that because when we're in a particular denomination or, uh, you know, uh, affiliation of other believers, there are, are just different ways of going about things and we can really hurt somebody if we don't uh, take those things into consideration. Limits of Christian liberty. First, the thing, you know, obviously we're limited by God's word. God's word guides us and, and tells us what is absolute sin and what is not. It's very cut and dried. And, and so we're, we're to be guided by that. We're to be limited in our liberties and what we think we can do and what we can't do by what his word says. But also, in addition to that, God words, writes his words on our heart. He writes his words in our mind. And he can fix us of things. And so then we're also limited by our own convictions. By the things that we know that God has dealt with us upon. I know that God has told me in my heart that, you know, I cannot do this. Drinking uh, for me was a big one. You know, I was never an alcoholic. I was never a person who had to have it. Uh, I was kind of a social drinker. But it stumbled my wife. My wife saw me with a beer, one beer in my hand at a party or something, and she immediately reverted back to when I was a a drunken, druggy idiot when I got out of high school. And she thought, oh no, he's going to fall. He's going to go back into that place. And it stumbled her greatly. And I had to come to a place of saying, I will never drink again because I don't want to stumble my wife. I will never drink in front of her again. Because I know it hurts her. I know it stumbles her. It makes her weak. It, ma- it, it just causes a problem. And so for the love of my wife, I did that. Later on, it became more of a conviction because I, I see in God's word that a pastor should not drink. You know, I think it's very clear that drinking isn't necessarily an evil thing for a, a general population, but for a pastor... It's pretty clear in Scripture, if you really get down to it, that a pastor can't drink. That's my conviction. That's the way I interpret it, and that's the way I see it. Others have, uh, you know, different ideas about that. Um, And I I think maturity, you know, as you you get more mature in the Lord and, and the Lord convicts you about different things, you put away those things. I don't need this anymore. I don't need this anymore. That's that's. When I was a child, I did childish things, but I'm, I'm grown now. I need to be thinking more about what the Lord has for me. And so we put those things away. And so our own convictions. What about the convictions of others, though? Uh, Friday night, we were talking about this passage in our home fellowship, uh, James 4, 17. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. If God has convicted you about something, and you know within your heart this is not something he wants you to do, and you do it anyway, it's a sin. Even though if it's not clearly written out, it's a sin because you know in your heart what is right and what is wrong. And if you do it, it's a sin. Again, back to Romans 14, 14. I know and I am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. And I I really see that with the alcohol thing. There's nothing unclean about alcohol. Now, you can talk about how foolish it is to get hooked on alcohol, how sinful it is to be a drunk, and a whole list of other problems that alcohol causes, but alcohol in itself is not evil. Alcohol in itself is not unclean. But... I know another reason that I stopped drinking, I know uh, when I would start drinking and, and get that little buzz, you know, my mind starts straying off into areas that I knew I shouldn't be thinking about. And, you know, just the places you end up when you're drinking and, and all the rest of it that goes along with it. It became a conviction in my heart that this is really not what I should be doing. But I don't have the right to force you into believing the same thing. I don't have the right to say, that's my conviction, needs to be your conviction too. You stop drinking. No, I don't have that right. I don't have that ability. That's for you and the Lord to come to that place. And so 
my Christian liberty is limited because of the convictions of others as well. Limited by the, your convictions, the convictions of people around me, the convictions of, of younger believers that I know I'm going to stumble. Because, you know, perception is, is really everything when it comes to this kind of stuff, isn't it? The perception that I have. If I don't think that I've uh, hurt you, it doesn't necessarily mean that I haven't hurt you, does it? Because your perception is that I have hurt you. And so I have to take it and, and say, well, I've hurt you then. I'm sorry. The convictions of others. You're going to wound their weak conscience. You sin against Christ when you do that. The conscience of others, the things that others think about, and, and we won't go in depth on these, the weakness of others, the weakness of a younger believer. We have to begin to take our knowledge and couple that with love and be sensitive in those areas. And that's just all about being a mature believer in Jesus Christ. A couple of quotes here from Warren Wiersbe that I really thought were great. He says at one point, uh, it is one thing to know doctrine and quite something else to know God. It is possible to grow in Bible knowledge and yet not grow in grace or in one's personal relationship with God. Again, looking at a Pharisee, they know the Bible. They know doctrine. But they don't necessarily have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They haven't grown in that area. They haven't grown in the grace of God and learned how uh, to be used by God in that way. And so the test of that is love, he says. The test is love. Love and knowledge must go together. Knowledge is power and it must be used in love. But love must always be controlled by knowledge. He finishes there and says, knowledge must be mixed with love, otherwise saints will end up with big heads instead of enlarged hearts. Some Christians grow, others just swell. <laughs> I like that. The idea is to be built up on a firm foundation. That's what Paul talked about early on. Build on that firm foundation with materials that are made of gold and silver and precious stones. Not building with wood, hay, and stubble. And when you're, when you're building with just knowledge, that's exactly what you're building with. You're building with uh, materials that are going to be burned up by the, by the fire. They'll be consumed by the fire. The last one there, the edification of others. Our liberty is limited by the need to build up others. That sacrifice. I will forego whatever, whatever it is that I think I should be allowed to do for the sake of building up other believers in Christ. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He sacrificed himself so that we may be saved. It's a, it's a perfect picture of, of you know, just that uh, becoming more like Christ, be, becoming more Christ-like. He was self-sacrificing. He was loving. For the sins of the whole world, he died. The Father, the Heavenly Father, loved you and I so much that He allowed His Son to die. And He says to you and I, that's the way I want you to act with others. More love. Love builds up. Love edifies. We'll close with this last verse from Romans 14 again. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. That's a loving thing to do not causing our brothers and sisters to fall. It's easy to judge each other. Oh, he's so immature. I saw him watching that movie the other night. If he was a real spiritual believer, he would not be watching that stuff. Oh, you know, I saw her drinking that beer the other day and just, wow. He can, we can judge each other. And that's an easy thing to do. I mean, you look around the room, we're all at different levels of maturity in the Lord. And it's so easy to judge when somebody's not quite as mature as you are. You think it is anyway. But then you go back to that idea that, uh, you know, if I really, really, truly knew God the way I think I knew Him, 
I would have the love in my heart not to be judging that person. And so consider that as you go out of here today. Don't judge your other brothers and sisters. Just resolve in your own heart not to stumble them for the sake of building them up rather than making them trip and fall down. Amen? All right. Well, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do love you here this morning, Lord. We desire, Lord, to be used by you in this way that we've been discussing. And uh, Father, we know that in our own flesh, though, we are completely unable. Lord, so we do ask for the power of your Holy Spirit to uh, just build us up, Lord. Help us, Lord, not to judge each other, but to love each other, to build each other up rather than tear each other down. We thank you for these things, Lord God, and we ask that you just help us put them into practice in our lives.